What I want to talk about today is the relationship between our uh, sense of complexity and our sense of agency. What we perceive as complexity might sometimes hold us back and make us feel like we cannot change things or we cannot make things happen. And I'm going to take quite a long detour to go through why this is a mistake and how we can get that sense of agency back. Um, I'm going to start from this. So if you are familiar with the internet, you would have seen millions of these images a million times. But it took us around 1,000 years for us to get comfortable with the idea that it's OK to take and share a picture of your lunch. <laughs> Bear with me. And this is actually one of the original memes that <laughs> propelled Instagram into the stardom of the social technology platforms. Um, but it wasn't just pictures of our lunch that we perfected and developed as a new behavior. It was also stretching your arm in really weird ways to be able to take pictures of your face by yourself, for example, in a toilet. <laughs> or, like in this case, with an elephant. <laughs> and then anything in between the toilet and the elephant and produce a book about it, which is geniusly named Selfish, which I personally own, and I'm really proud of it. <laughs> so there's also a museum of selfies. There's this Dutch art director that created this amazing Tumblr blog where she takes her Renaissance paintings, and then she just poses these images of a hand and a phone that is taking a picture of, uh, of itself, apparently, but is actually uh, taking a picture of the portrait. And it's just hands of visitors in the museums that are uh, taking this art form that King Kardashian loves so much to a whole new level and creating a museum around it. Now, you can look down all you want on these images, but uh, they actually are the result of a really amazing cultural evolution journey that we took exactly for 1,000 years. And I wasn't joking when I meant 1,000 years. It was in the 12th century that you have, for the first time, one of the tales, this is Tristan and Isolde, popularizing the idea of romantic love as opposed to godly love, like a earthly love, as opposed to something that is spiritual and immaterial. And it's the story of the adulterous love between uh, Cornish uh, prince Tristan and um, Cornish knight Tristan and Irish princess uh, Isolde. Now, why, the reason why this story is really important is because it puts on the map for the first time the idea that it's OK to represent something that has to do with abstraction or principles of religion or like mythology. Um, fast forward a couple of hundred years, and you are in this kind of scene uh, where you start seeing the village feast as a theme in Northern European art. And what's interesting in this painting by Bruegel is that he's not representing the village feast as something that is idealized. Uh, for example, the peasants, you can see them, they look really gritty, they look really dirty. He's showing us an idea of reality that is very much similar to the idea of reality that we experience if we are in that village feast. And it is a revolution for the time. Uh, again, if you fast forward for a few more years, you end up in the region, the Flandres, where the previous picture was also taken, where the market culture is developing a lot, commerce has developed a lot, towns are starting to build uh, markets, and the life of the town is starting to be centered around the market and the experience of the market. And what this changes is that it puts the produce, the goods, the items, the objects at the center of the scene, and they become pretty much the focus of the scene. As you can see, for example, in this other painting from uh, 1580 by Annibale Carracci, where the meat is actually the focus of the painting. This painting is titled The Butcher Shop, but it's the meat that is at the center of that painting. And it's not by chance that in the same time you have the birth of the still life as a kind of like pictorial genre, a way of representing things that focuses on objects that are inanimated. So this is pretty big stuff. This is pretty big cultural changes, and this is pretty kind of like much more similar to what we're seeing today in our pictures of lunches and our faces in front of a screen. 
Um, but what's happening here is explained by this French philosopher called Lyotard that uh, put it really nicely and really simply by saying that in the Middle Ages, um, visual representation was about uh, representing something that was not visible. And what happens with Renaissance is that we start to focus on visualizing and representing visually things that are visible. So the idea of visualizing something that is real and tangible and is part of everyday life is becoming dignified. And this changes a lot in terms of culture, but this requires a lot of changes in terms of the, what we think of ourselves and what we think of our place in the world. What's happening in the same period is we need to start measuring reality in a much more detailed and granular way. What's happening is what's called in uh, the kind of like modern science uh, kind of like terminology, the instrumentalization of the world. Uh, part of the revolution with the market and part with the kind of like development of uh, the kind of like modern science, here we are. Um, what's happening is that we start taking measures of the things that we're, for example, selling at the market. So all the principles of mathematics and physics that were applied to abstract idea before are starting to be applied to very tangible things. For example, how much of this fabric should I cut and should I sell to the customer? Um, what they changes is like this is introducing a whole new way of looking at reality. This painting is called The Measurer and is about applying these very abstract principles for the first time to really practical tasks. And this is also what sides, uh, what kind of like sits behind the idea of the uh, industrial revolution, the idea that we can now measure and quantify the natural world and we can, and we can create uh, production processes, transportation techniques, and experience, uh, ways of designing experience that are very much quantified and very much different from what we had before. For example, the idea of traveling in a train is, for example, exposing us to a whole new view of reality, a whole new point of view that we've never seen before. And we have machines that are literally changing the way we experience reality just by looking out the window of a train. Um, fast forward a few more years and you get to 1888 where you have George Eastman that is effectively putting a machine in the hands of everyone to try and change the way people represent their daily life and democratize the way we build visual representation with a Kodak camera. Fast forward another 120 years and cameras are everywhere. They are ubiquitous, they're helping us documenting every single moment of our life and we end up documenting our food and ourselves in the bathroom. So that's pretty much uh, what's happening there. Um, what, but, but the scale of what's happening, we couldn't really predict it at the time. What's happening is that we have now 4 billion images, this is an estimate, but there's around 4 billion images being shared on social media every day. And the scale of this expansion is something that has changed completely not only our experience of uh, reality, but it's also changing social media itself, which went from being a window into someone else's life rather than just uh, a forum for discussion online. And this is actually what makes social media a, an incredible and powerful tool for understanding society. And that's pretty much what I do. I scroll Instagram feed professionally, and um, um, I explain it to my mind by saying that I study society through social media data, or uh, to my dad by saying that I'm like uh, a shrink for the internet, and, uh, and that I get really complex riddles to solve, riddles such as this one, are these hot dogs or are these legs? <laughs> this is the modern classics, you would have seen it before. It's like one of the best Tumblr blogs ever created by humanity. Um, but apart from these incredible riddles and these really dif difficult challenges to interpret and solve, um, what we use social media for is also for understanding some pretty interesting facts about society. And I'll give you a quick example of a few different things that you can learn from this. Um, the first one is that Italians talk about food a lot. And this is no novelty, like food is obviously quite big in the agenda of Italians, and I'm Italian, so I wanted to start with this one. Uh, pizza is obviously top of our mind. Um, but what's interesting in this chart is that if you start to move down the line from pizza and you scroll down to the less discussed topics, slightly after cheese you have God and family, which which is amazing. So when Italians talk about food, they also talk about God and family, but not more than cheese. <laughs> um, when Valentine's Day comes, Italians go nuts on Nutella. So this is like people talking about Nutella before Valentine's Day, 
And this is what happens on Valentine's Day. Literally, they go wild on Nutella. They use it for everything and for every type of situation, every type of interaction. And it's all got to do with Valentine's Day. And I don't know why, and I don't even want to know. <laughs> um, and you can discover even slightly more serious things. Like when Margaret Thatcher died, one of the things that um, was said at the time was that the, the UK was quite divided. And the nation was divided about the legacy of Margaret Thatcher. But we then analyzed the conversations about Margaret Thatcher from the audience of six of the top newspapers in the UK. And you can see in red that most of them were quite negative about the legacy of Margaret Thatcher. So that gave us quite a lot of insight into how the debate was being shaped and what was really going on within these different views of um, what happened. Um, you can also learn to predict things, like a bit of an oracle. So this is a global music production company that has discovered that uh, every nine times that someone talks about a gig, they sell an extra ticket to that gig. So that is great for them to be able to predict whether they're going to sell out or not. Or this chart, I don't know, I, I know it doesn't say much, but this is payday. Can you guess what those spikes are at the top? It's a very simple chart, and what it's telling us is that people talk about payday a lot. They talk about it with very similar patterns. When I started to study this, I thought that we're talking about payday in a very kind of like once a month type of fashion. But what this chart is telling me is that people talk about payday every single Friday. Every single Friday, a lot of people wake up and they start discussing payday, where they get paid every week or whether they get paid once a month, but it's not that Friday, so it's a damn Friday that they don't want to be uh, getting out of bed even. And when they talk about payday, they talk about this kind of stuff, which is amazing. So the things that people share when they talk about payday is like, you can write a book about it, and it would be, it would be hilarious. Well, you can discover other things, like you can discover that the Daily Mail audience, the audience that is sharing, commenting, liking on any article from the Daily Mail, Contrary to popular belief, it's actually an old and male audience, which is quite interesting because I was convinced it was the opposite. I thought it was a female and young audience, but that's what this data is telling me. So it's changing completely the way I look at the Daily Mail and their audience. And I don't know whether it's a good thing. Um, this is a nice um, study by the United Nations Global Pulse Unit that uses social data to look at um, what's happening in the world. And one of the things that I picked up from this study was that uh, British people talk about support for financial support for people that are out of jobs a lot more than any other country in the world, proportionally to whatever else they talk about. But it's also the country that pays out almost the least in terms of benefits for people that are out of work. So that's quite interesting that there is this discrepancy. Maybe that's the reason why they're talking about it so much. But it's quite interesting to have this kind of view of society. Um, and this chart here is the chart of guilt and the chart of us trying to make up for it. So this is a chart that is telling me that um, we talk about resolutions, New Year's resolutions, for about three weeks in January, and then all the good ideas that we had go back to where we were in December, because that's people talking about having to save more and be more more moderate in the way they go about their life for the first three weeks of January, and then it all goes back to normal, which is quite amazing. Um, and this is a chart that shows how men are completely, well, behind, let's put it that way. So men only worry about their oral health once their feet are falling off. So this is a chart that's showing me what concerns people have about their feet um, by gender. And it's telling me that men are mostly concerned about decay, so they only talk about it once it's happening while women are mostly concerned about gum disease, which is kind of like a good way of preventing getting your teeth fall off. So it's a, it's a better strategy. Um, and finally, this is another um, kind of like things that you can learn when you want to use this data for predicting what's happening in the future. The Food Standards Agency discovered that they could predict um, how many people were going to get the norovirus, which is a really terrible form of flu, if you don't know what the technical term is for it. Um, by looking at how many people were talking about it. So they started tracking incredibly amazing hashtags, like hashtag Vomcano. And I'm not going to explain what Vomcano is, but 
by tracking this hashtag, they build an algorithm that is now helping them to predict when there's going to be the next epidemic in uh, norovirus, just by looking at what people talk about and being able to prevent, inform, educate, and prepare for a potential outburst of the virus. And the last one, one of the most interesting things about learning how people discuss about a disease is learning what kind of remedies they are thinking of uh, putting in place to fight back on that disease. In this case, with norovirus, people don't talk about drugs at all. The things that they talk about the most are clove, red onions, and garlic soup. And this is quite amazing, because this is Great Britain in 2015, so I found it really exciting as a finding. Now, the reason why using social data for um, understanding society is so powerful is because social data is at the same time something that is very qualitative, something that gives us a granular view of what's happening with a post on Twitter or a picture on Instagram, but it's also giving us the network level view, the bird's eye view of what's happening in society with millions of images, millions of opinions being shared. And this is the first time that in social science we have access to these two levels, because in traditional social science you can look at something that uh, is very qualitative, like an interview or like an ethnographic session with the things that you're studying, or you can get something that is more scalable but more quanti quantitative, such as a survey. What social data is doing is bringing these two elements in one place by giving us qualitative um, understanding on a quantitative scale. And this is quite unprecedented and quite powerful. Um, there's this um, French futurist from the 70s and uh, molecular bio uh, biologist called uh, Joël de Rosnay, who was one of the first ones to recognize that uh, something like the internet might have an impact on society, such as to help create something like a global brain. And he started to look at this idea of the global brain as one of the accelerators of the complexity that our society was dealing with. And then he came up with a trajectory for uh, which we needed to be prepared for. And he went back to the beginning of modern science again. So he went with uh, the idea that the telescope was something that helped us understand the infinitely big. The microscope then was invented to deal with the infinitely small. And now we were dealing with a new kind of infinite, the infinitely complex, the systems that our society has developed and that we're now part of. And he called for the need to develop a new set of tools to help with understanding these systems and understanding this complexity. And he called this tool the microscope. And I found this idea really fascinating because I think that part of what we're doing with understanding this data and understanding how we behave as a society with social media is a great way of building some of those tools to understanding complexity and help build this microscope. But um, what's really interesting about this is that when we look at these ideas, at this microscopic view, and this idea of this bird's eye view, and this idea of complexity, we seem to uh, kind of like lose touch with the fact that all these activities, all these phenomena, all these systems actually span out of micro actions that we take in the first place. Now, one of the things that I study the most is how ideas spread. Ideas generally spread in four kind of like ways. Uh, or like there's four steps for when an idea spread. It starts with an emotional trigger. There's something that touches us that uh, we find uh, funny, we find interesting, we find scary, we find exciting, we find ridiculous, and that triggers us to share that piece of content, that idea, that uh, video, that article that we found. Um, we then apply something like um, a relevance filter, something that we check against our audience, and then we decide uh, if the audience that we are in touch with is going to be actually interested in what I'm going to post, and whether the audience has seen it already. After we apply this relevance filter, that's the next step, which is basically happening when something has happened, someone has shared some of these um, ideas or some of this content, uh, but nothing really goes to a large scale until a tastemaker gets involved, something, something, someone with access to a large community and a large audience that can help us uh, kind of like get to the next level of diffusion of that uh, piece of content. And once that happened, once that taste making is in place, and once that um, gatekeeper has, has got access to his community and is developing these new networks based on what was shared initially, what happens is a really amazing phenomenon called appropriation. 
So once that idea is out there, people start using that idea to, as a platform to say things about themselves. So they remix that piece of content, they remix this idea, and they use it to say what they think of the world, using that idea as the seed of what they're trying to say. Um, there's a couple of videos that I wanted to show you that um, kind of like give you an example of what I mean by this, because it's a pretty delicate phenomenon. Um, social data is like fashion. We wear the words that we want to be seen saying. So it's not like if something touches me or if something is relevant to my community or is being shared by someone that I'm inspired by, it's not like I'm going to share it for sure. I'm going to share it only if it fits with what my persona is. So this is the, the first video I wanted to show you. It's Commander Hatfield singing Space Oddity from the space station. And you might have seen this video. He was in the space station, and I started recording this unplugged version of Space Oddity from David Bowie. And then he posted it on YouTube. Second video I wanted to show you is a video produced as a Vine series by the Scottish director called um, Ryan McHenry who then created a compilation of these brilliant genius videos and put it on YouTube as a video. And uh, you probably have seen this a million times, but can't resist showing it again because it's too good. Um, what's interesting about these two videos is that these two videos show us two very different ways for ideas and content to go viral. One that is really slow and one that is really fast. This is actually how these two videos spread, side by side. You have on the left, Commander Adfield singing Space Oddity, and on the right, Ryan Gosling one his serials. First thing that you notice about these two videos is that they move at very different speed, because that's the other factor that is like complex about how ideas spread. They can move really fast or they can move really slow. And the reason why they move really fast, really slow, lies into the structure of the audience that is sharing those ideas. So on one hand, you have Commander Adfield on the left-hand side that appealed to an audience that was quite tight-knit, with a lower number of communities in it, less fragmented. So that idea moved across that audience really fast. On the other end, you have a video like Ryan Gosling one in Serial, which appealed to a really vast group of people, a really diverse group of people that went from the marketing executive to the 16-year-old uh, girl in LA to the um, Vine geek and to the fan of the most funny YouTube videos. So it was really very different types of communities that got involved here. Um, but what's interesting is that they both got viral in completely different ways, and that's because the, the, the level of virality that is generated by the video is completely directed by the structure of the audience that is sharing the content. Now, again, when looking at this type of phenomena, what it's easy to forget is that these things span from micro actions that we're taking. And you look at this map and you think it's really interesting and it's crazy and it's fantastic, but it doesn't tell you the story that really started that process. And what I wanted to show you now to close is a story that takes you through from the moment where something gets shared to the moment when it goes viral. And now it depends on the individual beliefs, ideals, uh, hopes and geographies of the people that are involved in making that piece of content or that idea go viral. Um, I'm going to talk about this guy, which you might know as Elan um, Kordi. I'm not going to show the pictures that I'm showing you uh, that, that, uh, that, that spread at the time when his story, unfortunately, went viral. But it's the story of a kid that was three years old when his body washed up ashore um, in Bodrum. Turkey after his dinghy boat failed to bring him to shore and him plus a few other people on the journey died. What is interesting about this story is that the pictures that were spread uh, online were extremely strong. Like when I saw the first picture, it felt like getting punched in the stomach. And I saw it on Twitter on September the 2nd, 2015. And I started to see some people sharing it, but I didn't really understand how impactful that picture was going to be until the next day I saw the same picture cropping up on my Facebook feed. And what's interesting is that on my Facebook feed, I started to see the comments to the picture, and I started to see people talking about what was happening as um, something that related to refugees rather than migrants. And that made me think, is this Possible. Is it possible that this image is helping shape perception from 
a problem, an issue that is related to migrants to an issue that is actually related to a refugee crisis. If that shift was happening, this would have been a, an incredible shift because migrants are people that tend to move countries because they have an economical reason to move country and are looking for a better life, whereas refugees are fleeing for their lives. So if that shift was happening, that shift would have been an incredible change in the mindset and in the attitude of society towards the people that were coming to our countries from the country that were fleeing. Uh, so I did a little study. So I tracked how the conversations around the issue were changing and how people were mentioning migrants versus refugees. And this chart tells the story of how, until September the 2nd, people are discussing the problem as a problem related to refugee and migrants in pretty much the same levels, but from September the 2nd on, it's all about the refugee crisis. And the problem is discussed as a refugee problem. I looked at this again after a few months, and the trend continues. So what was happening here is that that image, that series of images about this kid, have actually changed the debate on immigration and has changed the way people see the problem now. Because it's all a matter of perception, so shifting perception is what might shift the way we resolve that problem. Uh, but how did this happen? It started with this tweet. It started with a tweet from uh, these activists and journalists called uh, Michelle Demishevich from Turkey. Uh, but before she posted this tweet, a Turkish press agency published the story on the web at 8.43 a.m. And Twitter was silent at the time. And nine, uh, 10 past nine in the morning, another Turkish press agency publishes the story, taking some of those pictures and leading with the pictures of Aylan Kurdi. But Twitter is still silent. It's only at 10.23 that Michelle posts this first tweet putting the pictures on the internet, putting the pictures not on the internet, putting the pictures on Twitter, and using a bunch of hashtags that connect those pictures to a bunch of other people interested in the same type of topics. And this is what starts to happen. This is in one hour from when she posted those pictures. You can start seeing how that idea, that piece of content is starting to travel online. And it's mostly a Turkish audience with a few Spanish people that are joining in because they are connected to Michelle Demichevich. Um, what happens next is that the network gets a little bit more complicated. So you start to see the image spreading through uh, the rest of the Middle East, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq. And what's interesting here is that is the physical geographies that are determining where the image is traveling until uh, Peter Bukert, which is the emergency director of Human Rights Watch, tweets from Geneva and connects this image and this story with a lot of development people that are involved in the humanitarian crisis. And here, this, this is when we start the story, we start to see the story changing a little bit. Uh, three hours in, another incredible thing happens. Uh, a journalist from the Washington Post, uh, Beirut uh, bureau uh, chief called Elizabeth Sly, she shares the image, which at this point has only been shared less than 500 times. And she received in the space of a few hours more than 7,400 tweets uh, that are retweeting her image. And what's incredible about this is that once she uh, put the story out there and connects to a network of journalists around the world, the story is actually going global. And it's going global and it's leaving the Middle East. And it's starting to travel through Europe, but it's also starting to travel through the States and through the UK and through Australia. So the story is now completely global, but no official media is actually covered until now. What happens next is that at uh, 10 past 1, the first official story from the press is published, and then after that, 500 more stories are published online, and an audience uh, gets kind of like a uh, reach that is 25 times more than the audience that was reached for the entire morning. So the scale of the process is completely changed. And what's happening here is that now that the story is mainstream and is popular, people are starting to remix that story. So you start seeing things like variations on the original images that start to appear as opposed to the traditional images that people were sharing at the beginning of the story. And you start seeing uh, incredible images like this one, or like this one in India, or this one in uh, Morocco, or um, this one as a criticism of the uh, European authorities and, and whether they were like not responding to a threat that has been, has been there and obvious to everyone for a long time. And this one, where someone was using this as a platform for saying that uh, at Saddam Hussein being there, he uh, would have taken care of him, and now he's taking care of him in paradise. So, 
And there's a whole kind of like host of reactions to this story, and people are really using this as a platform to say who they are and say what they think about the issue. But what's amazing is that in the space of 12 hours, this picture went from a camera of a photographer in a beach in Bodrum, Turkey, and reached 20 million screens around the world. And this is what's most fascinating about this, because we are looking at this story as something that is complex and something that is viral, but the reality of this story is that it was all down to the human elements behind the story. It was down to the professional networks that set the agenda for the story. It was all journalists and professionals in the space that understood that as a story. It was down to the local communities that engineered the global diffusion of the story in the different countries and then from country to country to the rest of the world. It was down to the shared interest of the audience that made this image spread really fast. And it was down to one single person that set up the entire process. And this is what I mean by uh, not being daunted by complexity and taking back our agency. It takes one person to set a process on, and then that process will be complex, but without that one person, that process wouldn't start. So you can be that person that set up the process. And what's interesting about this process is that it's a process that is engineered and supported by technology. And technology is always seen as something that's alienating us from our humanity and it's alienating us from the rest of the human beings on the planet. But in fact, what technology is doing in cases like this is giving us new senses to perceive a reality that has become much more complex and too broad for our body senses to be able to handle. It's interesting that uh, we always see uh, technology as something that is alienating rather than something that is expanding our senses. And as any tool, there will be great uses or ba bad uses of those tools. And we need to be able, as a species, to learn how to handle the bad results and the good results and make sure that we use the tool for the best means. Thank you. <laughs>